I'm John Gerizzo. I've been an artist in residence for two weeks at the Whitney Museum of Western Art uh, with the help of a Wyoming Arts Council grant. Uh, and I've spent the two weeks drawing the five N.C. Wyeths that are uh, some of my favorite paintings in the museum. Uh, now, John, tell us about your painting. Yep. Well, this is part of the Red Desert series, which is a series of paintings I uh, began back around 2000, 1999. Um, the original uh, intent of the images of horses came when a friend of mine, Mark Sprague, was uh, completing a book entitled Where Rivers Change Direction. And Mark asked me if I would consider doing the cover for it. So I spent some time over at the rodeo grounds uh, watching from the crow's nest and then did a bunch of drawings and took a bunch of photos and I actually initially did a bunch of watercolors based on those images. And shortly thereafter, and I did the cover of his book based on those images, kind of still horses, a, gr a still group of horses. And then shortly thereafter, uh, in Cody, there was a, a bucking horse sale. And, and I think it's an annual event and they run a bunch of horses down the street in Cody. And I happened to find myself on the corner of uh, where, where uh, the main, um, main street turns in front of the museum. And I was standing there with one of my heroes in art, Jim Bama, and the horses ran by and I took a bunch of photos and those photos ended up uh, lending themselves to a body of work, which I've entitled Red Desert Series. And this is one of them. Um, part of the inspiration of that also came from a fellow artist friend of mine, uh, by the name of Robert Gilmore, who has taught at Gonzaga University for over 40 years now, I believe. He's still painting, and he's uh, an abstract painter, but I had just seen his exhibit, and they were based on the same kind of idea of monochromatic paintings with the background being a different hue in each painting. And, uh, and so the Red Desert series emerged from a combination of those influences, Mark Sprague's book and, and Robert Gilmore's paintings. Hence, Red Desert Rose. Um, are all of your paintings in this series red? Not at all. Uh, what I did throughout the series, and they're all different sizes. I've done some that uh, are major diptychs that are 60 inches high uh, by 120 inches. Some are up to 180 inches by 60 inches. Some are small paintings that are down as, as small as nine by 12 inches. And they're all different colors in the background. Um, you know, I, I, I build a background color and then I build the images over the top of that background color. And really I covered the whole hue, uh, whole, whole spectrum of, of color. Um, but I do, I must say, I felt that the red were, had the most potency something about the red horses, and especially the reference to the red desert, which, by the way, <clears throat> came about because at the time that I was doing the cover of the book, I overheard a story on NPR, and the story on Wyoming Public Radio was of a group of 39 horses that they had found shot in the red desert. And not all the horses, they were shot at different times over a period of about a month, but in total, there were 39 horses that were shot. And so I decided to create a group of paintings as a tribute to each one of those horses. So my original intent was to create 39 paintings. I've gone way beyond that. Of course, that was back in you know 2000. The other part of the painting, the group of these paintings, uh, or inspiration for these paintings came out of the, uh, the Iraq War the, and 9-11 and that was going on. The original Iraq war and my response to that and 9-11. And uh, it was just more of an emotional and a lot of the colors kind of referenced that feeling of, of the war that was going on. So a number of influences in the beginning. Perfect. So you mentioned being influenced by photographs that you took. But do you work from? Yeah, they were they were more more than influences. Those were references. I think of the photographs as references. Now, what I do a lot is I take those photographs and then I create drawings from the photographs because you can't draw a group of horses running and catch it. So the photographs are a perfect reference. But I like the life that a drawing has. So 
when I use a photograph, I make a drawing from the photograph, or maybe a number of drawings. Maybe I even work it through some watercolors, some small oil studies, before I'd go to a big painting, because I like the life of the mark that you can't get out of the photograph. So Red Desert Rose, uh, this particular painting, you know, these paintings came quickly. So the, the inspiration for the body of work was, was the work, like the herd of horses, kind of had its own momentum. It really did, and I was on a roll. Part of it was a reaction to my own work, which I had it felt that my work was uh, becoming heavy and overworked. And I wanted my paintings to have a fresher, more drawing-like quality to them. So that was part of my own personal motivation uh, and development as a painter, just wanting to release myself through the paintings. Um, again, I told you I saw the Robert Gilmore exhibit at Spokane at Gonzaga University, and that really made me think about simplifying the images. So I stretched a canvas, and I always uh, stretch my own canvases. Put down a base color, and that base color is an acrylic, and this base color tended to be some type of red, cadmium red, maybe mixed with rose matter or lizard and crimson. Um, you know, hit and miss. I would just mix until something felt right. Uh, and then I respond with black paint. And so it's like a drawing in that sense. And black paint allows it to be transparent and let the color move through. Um, and I'd be looking at a you know, random photograph that I'd select from the body of photographs. Now the photographs, I should tell you, um, I took uh, were just with a 35 millimeter camera of these horses running down the street. And many of them were blurred because the horses were moving and they couldn't stay in focus. But I had a student of mine who was really good with computers and helped me out. And so he scanned the photographs. And then in the scanning of the photographs, I noticed that the back of the pack of horses was what was most interesting, not the ones up close. So we moved to the back of the pack and he scanned in those images in black and white. By the way, I like to work from black and white. I don't want the color of reality to influence my coloring. Um, so I looked at the back of those photographs and selected passages, and I like cropping. And so I cropped down a small area in the photograph, and then I'd randomly select, you know, one of those sheets, and they had them printed out in black and white in 8 by 10. I had piles of them in my studio, and I'd select one and just start drawing from it quickly because um, I wanted them to have that feeling of life. So I didn't labor over it. I really wanted to kind of lay out my compositions quickly. I'd work them up, you know, kind of a general composition in one day. The next day I'd let that paint dry just a little bit that I could start to wipe it down. And so a lot of the second day of painting is removing paint, the black paint and off oil paint in oil point, so. and, uh, and then letting that transparency come through the ground. And then I'd work back into it. And I'd do that over the course of a, a week, maybe. Most of these paintings were not much more than a couple weeks of painting. Some of them, of course, took longer or I'd paint them out completely where they don't exist anymore. And that's part of the process as well. Um, but this is one of the surviving paintings of that. And I felt like one of the more successful ones, uh, quite honestly, of the group. Do you um, um, varnish? I do. I just, after the paintings are completely dry, and that takes a long time with my work. Um, I tend to use safflower oil, which is a very slow drying medium, um, but very fluid. But uh, it means that you've got to let that paint really set up for a long time before you put varnish on. So if I exhibit, uh, and I have an exhibit coming up quickly, I'll do a spray varnish, just a light retouch spray to exhibit it. But about a year later, I'll put the final varnish on which is painted on. Well, so I'm, a, I'm an artist occasionally on a good day. So when things are going well and I tap into that mindset and that, uh, that moment when all the forms of art uh, come into balance, you know, all the elements come into play and they find their balance through me. And that day I'm an artist. Most days I consider myself a painter working hard toward that moment of becoming an artist. But it's a fleeting moment at best. Uh, and it's a term that I know you, Mindy, and I have talked about before, 
which uh, should not be taken lightly. I feel that the notion of artist, or the idea of artist, the term uh, is about humanity, not necessarily specifically just visual art, but uh, humans striving for our potential. And when we tap into that highest level of our potential, we then are artists. So, yeah, it's a term that I uh, make sure that my students are aware of so that they don't call themselves, make the mistake of calling themselves artists, but consider themselves rather art students. Be ready, uh, practice, be persistent. Um, if someone wants to be a visual artist, it's a long road, it's a lonely road, and it's a road that demands a commitment. Uh, a commitment to learning, a commitment to excellence, a commitment to understanding the history of those that came before you and your place now in that history and moving that history forward so I don't take it lightly. Um, it demands discipline uh, and daily practice and uh, a belief in yourself that you have something to say, that you have a story to tell, that you have signposts that you want to leave behind and that you're willing to see yourself through all the failures. Um, one of my favorite metaphors for art is baseball because in baseball, uh, if you fail seven out of 10 times, you're batting 300 and that's a great batting average that allows you to go to the Hall of Fame. But you fail seven out of 10 times and I feel that that's pretty close, maybe even a little bit better percentages than you get in art in your studio. You have to be willing to let yourself fail in order to see yourself become better. And, uh, and I think that's what art is all about. And that's why it, it goes beyond being just visual because it's a real lesson in all of life as a, as a parent, as a teacher, as a human being, we have to be able to accept those failures and move on. And art is just a metaphor for the human experience in many ways. I, I have to say that I am committed to the discipline of drawing and, and the classical tradition in learning to draw from observation initially because, because, not because I believe in representational images, but more importantly, because of the discipline one learns and through the practice of learning to draw. Um, and that practice is what you need then to put toward your painting because painting is even more demanding. And, uh, and drawing really is uh, the warming up. It's like if you're a musician and you're tuning up your instrument before you get ready to perform the symphony, that's what drawing is. Drawing is the warm up, especially sketching from life. It's letting yourself become focused and aware um, and be in the present rather than lost in all of the distractions of our world, you know. So I'm sorry, you're going to have to learn to draw before you become a painter. And I know that that's open for discussion and argument with many in the art world, but I'm taking a stance and after 32 years of teaching drawing, I feel strongly about that. What is it like? Wow, what, you talk to me on any given day and I'll give you an answer. I have to say that um, I do like the freedom and the independence of being uh, relatively anonymous, which is when I arrived here, I realized I had that freedom. I also had the challenge of having to bring contemporary art and the notion of being a contemporary painter to a place that really believes in itself and its history. And, and kind of mirrors itself against something that would, happened 100 years ago. Um, I'm, I'm drawing from the NCYS the past two weeks and I can't tell you how many people tell me that those are the real cowboys. And uh, when they look at the John Hall painting behind me of the rodeo, which is the Cody Knight rodeo right here every day, they don't wanna believe that that's today. And I feel we have a responsibility to communicate who we are now. Uh, so that's part of being a painter in Wyoming. I, I think the other part of being a painter in Wyoming is that I didn't have to play into the art market. I didn't have to worry about being famous or rich. I could really pursue my work <laughs> and I really could go after the, the problem without the ego getting in the way. It allowed me a certain sense of independence and freedom. 
And that, you know, that's really true. I mean, it allowed me not to have to be on stage all the time. I could isolate myself in my studio and, and be removed from that kind of hustle and bustle of the New York or LA art world. Um, the other part of it is there's a wonderful community that's regional out here. And there's a great diversity of artists working in lots of mediums and lots of directions, lots of different ideas. And we're all friends. You know, we all know each other. And I think that's fairly unique. I think if you get into an urban uh, center and you're an artist of any sort, then you have to live up to everyone else's example. And everyone's kind of looking over each other's shoulders and pushing each other and judging each other. Whereas I never felt that way out here. I felt like I'm a, uh, I have a great camaraderie and a great regional um, community of artists that I've been part of and, and have celebrated for 30 years out here. That's the thing about painting is, number one, what I love about visual art is that it's silent. Uh, it doesn't attack the viewer. It doesn't assault us like a TV commercial or radio or our world is so filled with uh, visual assaults, billboards, TV, now it's on our computers everywhere we go. You enter the museum, you look at a painting, if you own a painting, it's your choice. And then you can choose to take from it whatever you want. You can sit with it quietly and pay attention to it or you can ignore it. Um, and I like that about a painting. And that's what I want the viewer to do. I want the viewer to be engaged if they so choose and then to take away from it whatever they want. I really don't want to tell anyone what to think. I feel that as a painter, I don't want to be a judge. I want to be an observer and I want to respond. I want to be somewhat of a scribe to the visual world that, I, that surrounds me and then let the audience be a participant by choice. Uh, but not ever have it forced upon them. Well, I love the Whitney. Um, and again, you know, you can reference my talk, but because I loved N.C. Wyeth and Jim Bama, um, I drove from the Black Hills to just come see their work in this museum. And to this day, I still love that. I love Remington's work, uh, especially the field studies. I learned a lot about Remington when I saw those little field studies. Um, and in fact, I had the honor of working with Peter Hasserick, who was the director here when I first arrived uh, as a teacher at Northwest 32 years ago. And Peter invited me to come over one day when the museum was closed. And he had two tables laid out with white tablecloths and white gloves and um, four Remington paintings laid out on the tables and asked me to look at them as a painter and I could take the tacks out take the canvas out if I wanted to. And I learned that Remington was actually doing the landscape paintings in Wyoming and then taking them home on the train to New Rochelle and adding the figures back in his studio. That was a great revelation. So those Remington paintings have always been really important uh, and sacred to me. Today there's a lot of contemporary work that are uh, like I just finished talking about, comrades, you know, um, friends of mine. So when I see uh, John Hall, Ted Waddell, Russell Chatham, one of my all-time favorite painters, uh, you know, I'm going to overlook half of it. This museum is one of my favorite places to be. Um, when I need to think, it's where I come to contemplate. I love to look at the, the sculpture, the Remington sculpture, the Harry Jackson sculptures. Um, it, it goes on and on. I, it's really hard. I must say, when I'm thinking about it, Russell Chatham's painting uh, of Paradise Valley, that winter scene, is one of the all-time great paintings. Um, and that one struck me a long time ago. I believe he painted that in 1984. So it was about the time that I had just arrived here, too. So that's a special one to me. I could go on and on about well, that. Well, and that's kind of interesting, actually, that sort of monochromatic nature of Russell yeah, Chatham. That's a, and then I'm you know, yeah. looking at you with the, the red. Yeah, I hadn't thought about in that. The background, and I hadn't thought about it <laughs> yeah. either, so it's kind of interesting yeah. that you said that. Yeah, kind of, that's an interesting question, Emily. Um, it has, because uh, I often think that the reason my paintings are tightly cropped and busy, and the Guardian series, which was a series that preceded the Red Desert series, uh, was also tightly cropped, lots of figures, 
came out of my urban upbringing, growing up in Cleveland and the busyness of the urban center. So I always wondered, when is the space of Wyoming going to enter into my work? And in fact, I did do a body of work, which I didn't include in the talk yesterday, that was about the landscape. And it was about uh, a lot of earth moving equipment, because my little boy at the time, John Luca, loved heavy trucks and earth movers. So I found myself planted in town wherever they were digging new houses, you know, putting in foundations. So I, had, I did a whole series of paintings that were the Wyoming landscape being transformed by these earth movers. And that way it affected it. And now the baseball series that I'm doing, I've emptied out those cropped tight compositions and I've opened up the space like you have in the outfield of a baseball field. And I feel like maybe that's where the space of Wyoming is coming into my work, ironically. Which is really ironic because those re refer more to my life in Cleveland growing up with a baseball team. <laughs> but now the space has entered into it. So I don't know, that makes me think about it. Or for me, it's almost the opposite. I mean, there's something about, and this is me personally, yeah. there's something about that open, endless space that's sort of breathtaking and disorienting. Yes. And so to be able to kind of crop in yeah. and put some boundaries on it Absolutely. is helpful. Yeah, it makes me feel more secure. It puts me back. You yeah, know, right. yeah, maybe that's it. I don't know. I, I don't have an answer that for yeah. a lot of this. You know, I, I'm not an intellectual painter. I'm an intuitive painter. Um, I paint from the heart, really. I need to paint. Can't explain it. There's not a lot of logic behind why I do what I do. Um, but I have to say that when I build a composition that's dynamic, that's when I know an image is going to work. When that composition locks into place, then colors and form all follow. But composition is the lead, always for me. And so actually, you know, these paintings were as much or more about composition than they were horses. They were about negative shapes and the arrangement of negative shapes. So the horses emerge from the negative shapes rather than the negative shapes being the result. Um, they were more the impetus, how I arranged those negative shapes, how the light broke through the legs um, was the abstraction that I worked from. And so the, the, the abstraction came first and the representation came afterwards. Um, and I was often surprised when I was painting these, I would just be painting these shapes, this arrangement of dark and light shapes, and suddenly realize, oh, there are some horses' legs in there. Those are, you know, those are two horses. And when I'm painting them, my, uh, my impulse is to look for that arrangement of light and dark shape as an abstraction initially. Um, but they're ultimately representations of horses. So just my process.